Welcome to the JavaScript section of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript from the ground up course. JavaScript is the final technology in our triumvirate of front-end web development. We've seen how to use HTML for structure and content, and CSS for presentation. So, what is JavaScript for? JavaScript makes pages interactive. In other words, JavaScript controls the behavior of your web page. What do I mean by behavior? Well, you've probably seen examples of interactive behavior on the web before. One of the simplest examples is the ability to show and hide a section of the page, like a menu or an optional form. This can be accomplished with JavaScript. A more complicated example is inline form validation. JavaScript can check for valid entries in a form as the user types, instead of having to submit the entire form to the server first. JavaScript can even be used to create behavior that mimics desktop applications, such as the ability to drag and drop elements on the page. All these examples represent interactive behavior, and they're the type of things that JavaScript is best suited for. Before we delve further into the details of JavaScript, let's talk about how to get JavaScript into your web page. Similar to CSS, there are three methods, and we'll cover them in order from easiest to best. First, JavaScript can be included in line with your HTML either using the JavaScript pseudo protocol, as in the first example, or on event attributes, such as on click. In these examples, the do something function will be executed when the user clicks either of these two links. This is a bad method of getting JavaScript into your web page. In fact, you should pretend like you've never even seen it. Just erase it from your brain. Inline JavaScript violates several of our best practices for web development. As you can see, it breaks the separation of structure, presentation, and behavior by mixing behavior directly with our structural HTML. It makes the resulting code more difficult to maintain and also prevents graceful degradation. If the user has JavaScript disabled and clicks on one of these links, nothing happens. Inline JavaScript is bad news. Luckily, there are better ways of getting JavaScript into your web page. First, there's embedded JavaScript. You can include a script element containing JavaScript code in either the head or the body of your HTML. The browser parses the HTML from top to bottom, and it will execute your JavaScript code as soon as it gets to the script element. This method isn't bad. Even though we're embedding JavaScript within an HTML document, we're keeping it separated into a single section so that it can be more easily maintained. Finally, there's external JavaScript. We like this method of including JavaScript the best. You can create a separate JavaScript file containing all your code and then add a script element to your HTML in either the head or the body with a source attribute that points to the URL of that JavaScript file. As with embedded JavaScript, the browser will load and execute the JavaScript in your external file when it reaches the script tag during parsing. Okay, so now we've seen how to get JavaScript into our web page. Now, what can we do with it? <clears throat> Well, unlike HTML, JavaScript is a fully-fledged programming language, so there's quite a bit you can do. One common point of confusion for some people is that, in spite of the name, JavaScript isn't the same thing as Java. Except for some syntactic similarities, they aren't really related. Because it's a programming language, JavaScript has all the basic features that you'd expect. The goal of our JavaScript section isn't to teach you how to program. Some of you might already have some programming ex experience, and we just don't have time to teach the rest. Instead, we want to teach you the best practices for how JavaScript should be used. So we'll briefly skim over the features of the language, give you a sense of some of the syntax, and then switch to discussing how to use it. If you don't know how to program, and find the next part confusing, don't worry. It will make more sense once we start talking about the how. Like all programming languages, JavaScript has variables, where you can store a value and refer to it later. Here we're assigning the value 7 to a variable called foo. It also has operators. Here we're multiplying 3 and 2, adding 4 to the result, and assigning the final value to a variable called bar. JavaScript has strings as well. Here we're assigning the sequence of characters, a string, as a value to a variable called baz. JavaScript has arrays for storing a sequence of, variable, of values. Here we're creating an array with three values and assigning it to a variable called r. JavaScript has functions as well, which allow us to save a bit of code that we can reuse. Here we're creating a function that takes two arguments and returns their product. We assign our function to the variable f. If we call the function with the value 4 and 5, for example, we'll get 20 as the resulting value. JavaScript also has conditional blocks, which allow us to execute some code only if a certain condition is true. 
It also has loops, which allow us to execute the same section of code multiple times. We can loop for a specific number of times, or indefinitely, as long as a certain condition is true. JavaScript is also an object-oriented programming language. You can create a new object and assign it to a variable, and then create properties and methods on that object. A property is kind of like a variable that's stuck to an object, and a method is kind of like a function that's stuck to an object. Objects can help you to better organize your code. So, that's a really quick whirlwind tour of the JavaScript language. Now, non-programmers, you can open your eyes again. One thing that makes JavaScript special is that it's included in all modern browsers and has the ability to interact with and change elements on web pages. How does it do that? JavaScript interacts with the page through something called the Document Object Model, or the DOM. The DOM is a tree of objects that mirrors the nested structure of the elements in a web page. So, for example, if we have this HTML on the left side, JavaScript that runs in the page will have access to a DOM that looks like this one on the right. A document object maps to the body of our HTML document. It has three children mapping to the three paragraph elements, and so on. These DOM nodes are JavaScript objects, and they have properties and methods that allow us to alter their representations on the page. Conceptually, they're the handles that JavaScript uses to grab and change bits of the page. You may have noticed that the terminology we use for the DOM is slightly different than the terminology we use for HTML. An element in HTML corresponds to a node object in the DOM, and the element's attributes correspond to properties of the node object. So if the DOM is a mechanism that JavaScript uses to change bits of a web page, how can we grab a specific element so that we can do stuff with it? Well, one way is to use get methods of node objects. First, there's get elements by ID, which takes the ID of a particular element on the page, which should be unique, as a string argument and returns a reference to the node corresponding to the element with that ID. So you could do document.getElementById and pass in the string about, and that would be equivalent to selecting an element by ID in CSS. It would return a node corresponding to an element in the page like that div at the bottom with a matching ID. There's also get elements by tag name, which returns a collection of node objects corresponding to all the descendants of a given element that have a certain tag name. So for example, calling document.getElementsByTagName with an argument of p would return nodes corresponding to all the paragraph elements in the web page. That'd be equivalent to the elements selected by a CSS selector selecting all paragraph elements. Because these methods are available on any node object, they can be chained together. So doing document.getElementById about get elements by tag name p would be equivalent to that CSS selector, and it would return nodes corresponding to paragraph elements like the ones in the HTML example at the bottom. <clears throat> well, what if we want to get nodes by class names? Or what if we just want to write CSS selectors and get all the nodes corresponding to the targeted elements? Unfortunately, these nice-to-have features aren't a standard part of JavaScript. Luckily, there are lots of smart folks out there on the web who've already written get methods like these, you can find a collection of them at getElementsBy.com. Advanced Git methods are also a part of most JavaScript libraries. A JavaScript library is a collection of helpful functions that make writing JavaScript more efficient. If you're writing your own JavaScript, I highly recommend using a JavaScript library. There are lots to choose from, including Prototype, Dojo, YUI, jQuery, and MooTools, and many others. All right. So, how else can we get references to specific DOM nodes in JavaScript besides get methods? Well, we can also use node properties to get nodes near an existing node in the DOM tree. For example, there's the parent node property, which is a reference to the parent node of a given node. If we have a reference to the paragraph node in blue, for example, parent node would give us a reference to the div node in orange. Parent node lets us walk up the DOM tree. We can also walk down the DOM tree using the child nodes, first child, and last child node properties. Given the example HTML on the right and a reference to the paragraph node in blue, child nodes would give us the nodes for all the child span nodes in green. First child would give us just a reference to the first span with orange text, and last child would give us just a reference to the last span with blue text. Finally, the next sibling and previous sibling node properties allow us to walk horizontally across a given level of the DOM tree. Given a reference to the span node in blue, previous sibling would give us a reference to the span node in orange, and next sibling would give us a reference to the span node in green. 
One thing to watch out for when you're writing JavaScript that interacts with the DOM is where you place the JavaScript within your HTML. As I said earlier, the browser parses your HTML page from top to bottom, and it executes JavaScript as soon as it's encountered. So, if you insert JavaScript in the head of your HTML document that references DOM nodes, it won't work. Those DOM nodes don't exist yet because the parser hasn't even reached the body tag. A common pattern for dealing with this potential problem is to include a JavaScript file in the head of your document that doesn't execute any DOM-related code immediately. Instead, it should define a function called initialize or something similar, which can then be called at the bottom of the body once all the HTML is parsed and in the DOM. Okay, so we know how to get references to DOM nodes using get methods and node properties. What can we do with the elements on our page once we have a reference to them? Well, the main thing that we'll want to do is to attach events. An event is something that occurs whenever an action happens on the page. These are some of the common events that you'll likely want to use. There are events when elements are clicked, when the mouse moves over or out of an element, when the mouse button is depressed or released, and for form elements, there are events when the elements lose or gain focus, and then for the entire page, there's an event when the page has finished loading. There are actually a lot more events than the ones listed here, but these are the most frequently used and the most important for us to know about today. You use events by attaching a listener function to an element for that event. When the event occurs on that element, the listener function gets called. So if we have a reference to a node in a variable called L and a listener function called do something, here's how we detach that listener function to the node so the function is called when the element's clicked. In Internet Explorer, we use a node method called attach event, which takes an event name with on stuck to the front and a reference to the listener function. In literally every other browser, we use the standards compliant add event listener node method, which takes an event name, a reference to the listener function, and, non and another argument that has to do with something called event capture. Don't worry about that for now, just use false for the third argument. Well, that sucks. In order to attach an event, we have to determine which of the two methods exists in the browser that we're in, and then use that method. This happens a lot with JavaScript due to non-standard implementations across different browsers. The solution is to package this bit of code up into a new function that we can use over and over again to attach events regardless of browser. Most JavaScript libraries provide event management functions like this one and more, but you can also find small single purpose functions on the web. In this event attachment code, we're using a conditional statement to determine whether to use the standard method or the Internet Explorer specific method. Do you notice how we're not specifically checking for the name of the browser? That's called object detection, and it's a really good idea. Instead of checking the name of the browser and then using a method that you know works in the browser today, you can check to see if the method you want to use actually exists on the object in question. This is a good idea because the capabilities of browsers may change over time. If IE13 is released someday and suddenly supports the standard method of doing things, but your old JavaScript code checks for the name IE, your code is going to break. Doing object detection instead of browser detection makes it more likely that your code will continue to work as new browsers are released. Alright, so we've got references to DOM nodes and we've attached event listeners. Now, what can we do with them? Well, we can do pretty much anything we want. Okay, fine, so maybe we can't do anything, but we can do a lot. For instance, we can change the style of our elements. We could, for example, hide an element by setting the display to none. We could create an error state by setting the color to red. We could even create more complicated states by setting multiple style properties like font size and background color. In fact, all of the CSS styles that we're familiar with from the previous section are available in JavaScript on nodes via the style object. Properties that are dash separated in CSS are camel cased in JavaScript. Also, did you notice the keyword this in those examples of changing the style? What's that about? This is a special keyword in JavaScript that gives a reference to the object that owns the function or method. For event listeners, this refers to the node that the event listener was originally attached to. This is useful because we can write a single event listener, attach it to multiple nodes, and then this will refer to whichever node was clicked when the listener function is called. Okay, so we're changing the style of elements on the page with JavaScript. Now we've got a problem. We're mixing presentation with behavior. If our designer wants to change what a certain application state looks like, he'll have to dig into the JavaScript code to do so. We need to find a way to enforce our separation of presentation and behavior 
while still allowing our JavaScript to affect the page. What can we do? Well, we can also change the class names of elements using JavaScript. This is a much better approach because it allows us to use classes to define application states without saying what the presentation of those states should be. So, instead of hiding an element with a style, we can give it a class name of inactive and define that inactive elements are hidden in CSS. Or, instead of changing the color with style, we can give the element a class of error and define that errors should be in red in CSS. We can even define multiple class names in JavaScript that correspond to multiple CSS rules. So we're changing class names, which is a lot better than changing styles directly, but what if our elements already have classes that need to be maintained? For example, if we have a paragraph with the class special and we do class name equals inactive in JavaScript, we've overridden the original class name and probably screwed up our page. Whoops! What we really need instead are functions that add classes, remove classes, and check to see if an element has a particular class name. Unfortunately, these aren't built into JavaScript by default, but they are part of most JavaScript libraries, and there are standalone examples on the web as well. Finally, remember how browsers have defaults for presentation that CSS can change? Well, the same is true of behavior. The browser has some default behavior that can be altered using JavaScript. For example, clicking on a link normally causes the browser to navigate to the URL in the href attribute. That's default behavior. However, if you attach a listener function to that link on the click event and call the prevent default method on the first argument passed to the listener function, you can prevent the default behavior and cause the link to do something else instead. Just like CSS, the best way to learn how to use JavaScript is to see it in action. Let's move on to the JavaScript exercise screencast, where we'll add some behavior to our page by grabbing nodes from the DOM, attaching events, and changing styles and classes.